Welcome to this joint service of First Presbyterian Church of Sterling and Myersville Presbyterian Church in New Jersey. Today is the 24th Sunday after Pentecost, the 15th of November. Next Sunday, November 22nd, will be Myersville's Stewardship Sunday. And the week after that, November 29th, believe it or not, we begin the season of Advent. And there will be an Advent devotional available for anyone who wants one, either an emailed PDF or snail mail printed copy. Just let me know, email me, or call the church and let me know that you would like one. And though our weather has smiled on us so far this fall, our warm weather will not last. So we at Myersville are collecting used, but in good shape, winter outerwear and blankets to give to those who don't have enough warm clothing. If you have coats, hats, scarves, gloves, or blankets in good repair, you can bring them to the church and we will make sure that those who, who need them will get them. Just call the church office first to find a good drop-off time when to be sure someone is here. Thank you and let us worship God. Listen, we hear you in the laughter of a little child. We can hear you in the babbling of a baby. You don't need words to tell us of your power. Why do you need us at all? We are so small and the world is so big. The stars are so many and space is so enormous. God, our living God. You are amazing. You made everything. Why do I matter? But we do matter. God cares for most of all. And through us, God cares for all the world. You put everything into our care. All the animals, all the birds, all the fish. Everything that, cre everything that creeps or flies or runs or swims. Even the land and the air and the sea. It is ours to look after. God, our living God. You are amazing. <laughs> Amen. Let us pray. We lift up our eyes to you, O gracious and abundant God. We praise you for your goodness and for your mercy. Show us your vision of life everlasting. Remove any veil of brokenness that would prevent our seeing clearly the world that you imagine for us. In this hour of worship, meet us where we are. Guide us to where you would have us be. We pray in the name of Jesus, the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. reading comes from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, the first one, chapter 5, starting with verse 1. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who are drunk get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. And then from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 25, starting with verse 14. For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away, and the one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. 
After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I've made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy servant. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I've made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy servant. You have been trustworthy in a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take that talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they who have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless servant, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Thanks be to God for the word given us in scripture. Amen. The long tail is a colloquial name for a feature of probability statistics. If you have a graph of how likely different things are to occur, the graph will begin on the left with the high likelihood items, and then there'll be this tapering down long tail of less likely occurrences. And this long tail of lots and lots of unlikely occurrences will, in the end, actually add up to outnumber the most frequent occurrences. For example, in the English language, the word the is the most common word. And other short words such as of, is, have are also, of course, very common. And these common words are way more common than most other words. 12% of all words are the. While the word, for example, barracks, occurs less than one out of 50,000 words. But altogether, the words that are as rare as barracks make up about a third of all text. These rare words are, in statistics, the long tail in English vocabulary. And though they may be rare, if you add up all the rare words, there are more of them than the common words. And this long tail idea has implications for business and for marketing. Say you're shopping for a book. And if the book you want is a bestseller, you can go into any Barnes and Noble and get it. And it will probably be on that table by the entrance right when you first walk in. But if you're looking for a more obscure title or something that's maybe out of print, you have to go to a source that covers a wide range of titles, maybe Amazon or some other big online bookseller that makes its money by offering titles for the interests that extend way out on the tail toward obscurity. So the rarer things, the rarer books. If we think of this business model as a cat, the Barnes and Noble is the head of the cat. And the limited, offer, the limited offerings and Amazon or eBay as the tail of the cat. 
the offering of just about unlimited possibilities. And it's the long tail that's the place of, of unlimited choices, of abundance, of uniqueness, of creativity. Well, Jesus told his disciples the story of a man who went on a long journey, and before he left, he distributed property among his servants. To one, he gave a whole lot of money. Five talents is a whole lot of money, like a million dollars. To another servant, he gave $400,000, and to a third, only $200,000. And the one with a million invested his million and made another cool million. The one with 400,000 also doubled his money. But the servant given $200,000, dug a hole in the backyard, stashed the cash in a big coffee can, buried it, and then just waited. This third servant was afraid. He was afraid he was going to lose the money. He was afraid of his boss. He was so afraid of imagined consequences of losing the money that he just hung on to the cash and thus limited his options. He limited his possibilities. Really, in a way, he chose not to choose. He was afraid to grab the long tail of abundance, of choices, of creativity. He was like the bookstore that fills all available shelf space with John Grisham and Stephen King novels. All the same. The five talent servant, on the other hand, the that's the first one, the million dollar one, he moved out onto the long tail. He looked around and he saw abundance, he saw opportunities, he saw choices. And he knew he could multiply his money if he was willing to risk a bit. He's like an online bookstore that offers less popular titles, but a whole lot more of them. It's a little riskier, but potentially very profitable and of course, offers more to more people because more people have broader interests. So spiritually speaking, are we as the church or we as individual people living at the head of the cat or on the long tail? Is our cash buried in the coffee can or is it out there multiplying? Whether we're talking about money or talking about our talents, our gifts. Now, to, to continue this business metaphor, as Christians, we have a kind of insider trader advantage. Because God knows what gifts we've been given. And God knows what our interests, our passions, what our concerns are. God knows because God gave them to us in the first place. And God gave them to us in the first place for the purpose of their being used. Used and stretched and multiplied in the service of God's vision for the world, in the service of God's kingdom. Whether our gifts are and our interests or our joys are teaching children or cooking meals or repairing houses or programming computers. Those gifts, those passions, those interests, they were given to us by God. And so it makes no sense to hide them or to, to sit on them, to bury them, or to worry about being successful or just pretend to be successful. God wants us to be the unique and interesting individuals God created us to be. People who may have unusual but valuable abilities. Out on that long tail, 
st statistically speaking, there are nurses' aides in hospitals who take pride in their patients being clean and comfortable. Carpenters who don't take cheap shortcuts. Teachers who find joy in their students' discoveries. Artists who bring beauty to everyday life. Reformer Martin Luther encouraged the people of his day to milk their cows to the glory of God. And most of these workers, teachers, artists, carpenters, nurses' aides, cow milkers, will never be rich and famous like the authors of bestsellers, but they will make a significant impact on the world around them by their willingness to invest the talents they've been given. The church also is called to be like the servant with the million who makes another million. We have a great storehouse in the church of talents and abilities and as the body of Christ in the world, we share these talents, conscious of their abundance, and we take risks with this abundance by deciding, by choosing to be generous. This means we're willing to try new things, to risk ourselves by singing in the choir, even if you've never done it before or serving on the session, even if the thought scares you, or helping out with one of our missions, even if you're already really busy. It means extending ourselves to help people that we don't even know, taking the extra step from thinking, oh, isn't that too bad, or isn't it a shame, to actually acting out of abundance with generosity, with sharing, to help. A uh, man who's kind of Parker Palmer, who's kind of a philosopher and he's a writer who wrote, writes mostly about teaching. And he tells the story of something that happened to him when he was, was starting out on a trip. He was flying to Denver. So he was traveling by air and the plane pulled away from the gate, taxi to a remote corner of the airport, and stopped. The engine roar faded, and his heart sank. And the pilot's voice came over the speakers. I have some bad news, and I have some really bad news. The bad news is that there's a storm front in the West and Denver is shut down. The Denver airport is shut down. We've looked into alternatives and there are none. We have to sit here for a few hours. That's the bad news. The really bad news is that there is no food on board and it is lunchtime. This was back when there usually was a meal served on most flights. So everybody on the plane groaned. Some passengers started to complain. Some became actually quite angry. But then one of the flight attendants did something amazing. She stood up and she, she stood there and she said into the mic, we're really sorry folks. We didn't plan it this way and we really can't do much about it. And I know for some of you, this, this is a big deal. Some of you are really hungry and you were looking forward to eating lunch. Some of you may have a medical condition and you really need to eat lunch. Some of you may not care one way or the other. And some of you should probably be skipping lunch anyway. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. She said, I have a couple of empty bread baskets up here in the front, and we're going to pass them around. 
And I'm asking everyone to, to put something into the basket. Some of you brought a little snack along, something to tide you over, just in case. Some of you maybe brought peanut butter crackers, a candy bar. Some of you have a few lifesavers or some chewing gum. And if you don't have anything edible, you have a picture of your children or spouse or a bookmark with a pretty picture on it or a business card. So I want everybody to put something in the basket when we pass it around and then we'll reverse the process. We'll pass the basket around again and everybody can take out what he or she needs. Well, what happened next was amazing. The griping stopped. People started rooting around in pockets and, and purses, and some got up to pull things, pull things out of the, uh, the overhead luggage racks. Candy, a salami, crackers, a bottle of wine came out. And people were laughing, they were talking. The flight attendant had transformed a group of people focused on need and deprivation into a community of sharing and celebration. She had transformed scarcity into what was really a kind of abundance. Well, after the flight, which did eventually get to Denver, Palmer, the, the, Palmer was the, the philosopher writer, was getting off the plane. And he stopped to say to the flight attendant, do you know there's a story in the Bible about what you did back there? It's about Jesus feeding a lot of people with very little food. And she said, I know that story. It's why I did what I did. God calls us to a theology, a faith of abundance, not scarcity, not hoarding. Another way of thinking of this, this generosity of spirit, this faith of abundance is to call it by the name that God calls it, which is love. C.S. Lewis wrote about hoarding and sharing love in his book, The Four Loves. And Lewis said, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. If you, want to make, if you want to make sure of keeping your heart intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in a casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless. It will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The alternative to tragedy, or at least to the risk of tragedy, is damnation. The only place outside heaven, Lewis says, where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers and perturbations of love is hell. A pastor friend of mine wrote in his church's newsletter about Presbyterian saints. In the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 11, the author lists heroes of the faith. And he refer, refers to these heroes as ancestors. But the Greek word in the text isn't exactly ancestor, doesn't translate exactly as ancestors. The text says presbyteroi, 
meaning elders, from which we get the name of our denomination, the Presbyterian denomination. The list of presbyteroi are remembered in Hebrews. That list is impressive. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets, and a host of others who were tortured and imprisoned for their faith. What an awesome list of Presbyterians. Okay, so technically they were not Presbyterians as defined by our church constitution, our book of order, but they lived and died by their faith. These were all people who, by faith, stepped out from what had given them security. They were called to move out of their comfort zone, out of their previous experience, what they already knew, to go in a new direction. They were called to risk using gifts and abilities that they maybe didn't even know they had until they used them. We just don't get a promise of absolute clarity. We don't get a sure thing. There are always uncertainties and questions. But in Jesus Christ, we see what God is like, how far God is willing to go to ensure that we know we are loved by God. Faithful living is not about the size of our faith or how passionately we feel it or how eloquently we can articulate it. It's about the daily decisions, the daily choices we make to trust God and to live out there on that long tail of creativity, of abundance, of generosity, of love. Let us pray. Gracious God, maker and giver of all good things, you've given your church uncountable talents and provided us with great bounty. Sometimes we're wise and we use these talents for a good purpose. We invest them, foster them, see them grow in usefulness to your kingdom. At other times, we're afraid and do not use what you've given us in ways that promote the gospel or your work in the world. Teach us, we pray, to be wise and loving stewards of all that you give us. May we learn to share generously and joyfully from our abundance. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we come to you in prayer, knowing that when we struggle to find the words or cannot articulate our hopes and fears, we can trust that you know our needs, even when we are unable to speak them aloud. We rest in your presence, trusting your compassion, rejoicing in your love that refuses to let us go. We pray that the church would be a near reflection of its head, Jesus Christ, when the world roils in violence make us make of us peacemakers when the oppressed cry out for help send us to bring good news in the form of justice and relief when your children are hungry help us to feed your sheep we, may we be leavened for reconciliation and healing in our communities we pray for our nation in the wake of a divisive election we recognize the rips in the fabric of our communal life we do not have the power to overcome animosity and rancor on our own, so we need your intervention and transformation. Grant those in positions of earthly power, humility and wisdom, spiritual maturity, and a willingness to listen. May each of us be catalysts for good wherever we have influence. We pray for the welfare of the world. You named every inch of it good. As we live and move and have our being in you show us how to tend and nurture all you have entrusted to us knowing that you make us stewards what does not belong to us we ask for you the courage to use all we have for your sake and in your service we pray for those who suffer in body mind or spirit these are those known to us whom we name now Bring healing, wholeness, relief, and peace to those most in need of your presence and love. We pray for ourselves that we would better love you and neighbor with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. and the generosity of God's gifts to us. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen.